Hello, friends. This is Dave Hurwitz, executive editor at ClassicsToday.com, here with our special preview of the 10 best recordings of Nicholas Harnoncourt. And that video you can see if you are a ClassicsToday.com insider subscriber. Just mosey on over to ClassicsToday.com and have a look at that special video. And what better way to preview the 10 best video than by talking about his five five worst recordings. I could do 10, but I think five will make my point adequately. I really do. The five worst recordings of Harnoncourt. This is fun because Harnoncourt was one of those conductors who was either very, very good or very, very bad. And not usually one or the other. And for the same reasons, because the same qualities that made him very good made him horrendous as often as not. I still believe that he was a genius and one of the handful of truly, truly great conductors of the second half of the 20th century and a bit thereafter. Let's call it the long 20th century. He had an incredibly personal way of dealing with music. And the irony of that is that he made his career um, doing period instrument stuff and Baroque and early music, which is not the kind of music over which you can lavish, you know, endless quantities of of romantic, um, you know, shall we say, personal expression stuff. But, you know, the truth is, and this is what he teaches us, the truth is, is that it doesn't matter. There have always been artists who interpreted their music extremely personally, who messed around with it, who ignored what the composer wrote, who had very strange ideas about musical syntax and expression. They are, they've always been with us. And in quantity, many of them. The whole idea that you were doing something authentic was a joke. And he would have been the first person to admit it because everything he did reflected his personal magnetism, his personality, his view of the way the music is supposed to go. And it, it, the only thing that was, you know, unusual about it is that it reflected that from the position of a conductor, which of course didn't exist in the early period, in the earlier time that often his music uh, came from. But it doesn't matter. It really doesn't matter. The bottom line is he did everything the same way. <laughs> it didn't matter what it was. And with his own peculiar brand of interpretive genius. And sometimes it worked and sometimes it didn't. It most clearly did not work in music from the late classical period forward because that's the music we know very well. And so we have many, many performances that we regard as exemplars available for comparison. In early, early music, it's impossible to tell how grotesque he was being because we don't have any basis for comparison and we don't know the style. I mean, if he's doing, for example, Bieber or something like that, and he's mucking something up, we're not going to know. We really aren't, unless you're an expert in that kind of music. And we're just as likely to accept it because we don't have lots of comparisons ready to hand. But if, on the other hand, it's Beethoven or something of the Romantic period, and he's decided to be perverse, hmm, then we notice it's pretty obvious that something is rotten in the state of Denmark. Sometimes it's not rotten. Sometimes it's fabulous. Sometimes we're snacking on marzipan fruit. It's delicious. But sometimes, well, you know. Anyway, you get the point. So let's, let's take a moment, <clears throat> or a few moments, and talk about his five most appalling recordings. And uh, I think uh, these are pretty uncontroversial. Well, some of them may be more than others. Let's start with Beethoven. I've trashed this recording a hundred times already. The Pastoral Symphony. You know, Harnacourt did what was basically a very good Beethoven cycle. It was with the Chamber Orchestra of Europe and a mixture of modern and period instruments. Not that that really made any difference. But oh my, with the Pastoral Symphony, all hell broke loose. You see, Harnoncourt had, from his study of Baroque music, you know, a little knowledge is a dangerous thing. He was, generally speaking, a very good scholar and a very good practical musician, you know, in terms of applying that scholarship. But he had this thing, a bee in his bonnet about rhetoric, about Baroque rhetoric, and about how 
rhetorical devices were applicable to music. And also how, well, let me just, let me just put it to you this way. He was mannered the way Leonard Bernstein was mannered. That is, people say that Bernstein was, you know, emotional excess and spontaneous, you know, effulgence and all of that stuff. And he was. But, but what really annoyed people about Bernstein, I think, was that he was an educator. He was preachy. He was doctrinaire, actually. He was trying so hard to communicate what he thought was the meaning behind the music that it became less of a performance and more of a lecture demonstration. And one in which the point that he was trying to make became exaggerated. I mean, to the point of obviousness, even vulgarity. And that is what Harnoncourt did. Exactly the same thing. It's really fascinating because you probably won't find anyone who would compare the two, but they really should be compared because they were both kind of romantic, egomaniacal it, it, people with this, this intense urge to, to reach out and express and explain. And so Harnoncourt's explanation for the Pastoral Symphony is that, duh, it was pastoral, and therefore all of the qualities of pastoralosity or pastoraliciousness, or whatever you want to call it, needed to be emphasized. So that meant incredible legato phrasing, the relaxation of the countryside, the laziness, the torpor, everything that you hate about the country, the bugs floating around, the lack of air conditioning, the impossibility of finding toilet paper and real plumbing or air conditioning, all of that stuff. You had to, he had to emphasize that in the pastoral symphony. So it is just the dullest, most irritating, lacking in climaxes, lacking in tension, lacking in contrast, all in the name of pastoral niceness. And gosh, it's the opposite of nice. It's wretched. So that's one of his worst performances because he is trying way, way, way too hard to tell us what the music already explains so beautifully the way Beethoven wrote it and which we already knew from the title so there was no need to go any further. And that was his thing. So next, after Beethoven, number two, the Brahms symphonies. Harnoncourt never got Brahms. I, you know, he, the only decent Brahms he did, I think, were the concerto accompaniments. He did the two piano concerti, I think, with Buchbinder in the Concertgebouw, something like that. That was okay. And even those were notably slow and sort of, you know, different. But boy, the symphonies with the Berlin Philharmonic, of all people, it, 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 they go all wrong. You know, Brahms was supposed to be nervous because Beethoven was, you know, this tra tread of Beethoven was behind him while Harnoncourt was nervous because all of those German conductors doing Brahms forever and the Brahms tradition, I mean, it was a, a, a settled quantity and he wanted to shake it up. So what did he do? He, I have never heard a major orchestra like Berlin, which knows the music backwards, forwards and sideways, sound so uncomfortable. My God. God, they are the most, the most distracting performances. They have weird balances and strange phrasing and odd emphasizing of inner voices. And they're just the weirdest performances you have ever heard in your life. And again, there's no reason for it. I mean, you can't say like Beethoven's Pastoral that there's a program or there's some sort of, you know, reason for what he was doing. It was just sheer perversity, the need to be different, the desire to do something different. And the orchestra did not sound like it wanted to go along with him. And the result is, I mean, you know, it's Brahms. It's not going to be horrible in a, you know, it wasn't, it wasn't Dadaist. It wasn't that crazy. I mean, like Stokowski could be crazy, you know, and it wasn't like that, but it was still awfully, awfully uncomfortable and completely unsatisfying expressively because you were always conscious of the fact that rather than the music speaking to us, something was being done to it, something externally, you know, from the outside. It was being manipulated constantly and Un unpleasant ways. So those Brahms symphonies were just wretched, absolutely wretched. And after Brahms, well, we have to talk about Bruckner, don't we? Bruckner Symphony Number no. 8. 
Now, Harnoncourt did some fabulous Bruckner. And the fascinating thing about all these wretched performances is that, you know, he would be just as likely to do a marvelous performance of something else, sometimes by the same composer, although there's an exception coming up. But the Bruckner Eighth was, was just a mess. I mean, it was really, really a mess. It, it had no climaxes that worked. It had a, a, a constant manipulation of rhythm that, that made the music seem interminable. You know Bruckner, and you know the eighth particularly. He's always about a, 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 a duplet followed by a triplet. Dum, bum, 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 or dun, dun, dum, bum, bum, you know, something like that. And the eighth is, is of course, you know, full of, full of that rhythm. Da, 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 da. You know, that's, that's the eighth. Oh, my God. But the way he does it, dum, 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 dum. You know, there's, he would take a motive and, and have it phrased or accented in a peculiar way. And then in, with Bruckner, because you're going to hear that motive 30 trillion times in every movement, it sounds awful every time you hear it. The whole thing just becomes an exercise in mannerism. And that's what his Bruckner eighth is. It's, it's a shame because he did marvelous Bruckner. He did a great Bruckner ninth. He did a great Bruckner fifth. He did a great Bruckner. You know, he did, did some wonderful Bruckner, but not the eighth. And you have to ask yourself, what was it that made him want to play it so strangely? I have no answer. None of us have an answer. He just did it that way. But now we come to a double feature. The composer, he probably did worse than any other composer in, in his repertoire and should never have touched. I mean, one thing about Harnoncourt also is that he really had very little conception of what he couldn't do. Remember, he did Porgy and Bess. And the Porgy and Bess, by the way, isn't the worst thing he ever did. It's boring. It's just boring, but it's not, it's not demented. It's just, why in God's name is this man doing Porky and Bess? I actually thought that as an April Fool's, you know, joke review, I was going to do Hard Court Plays Gershwin. And then Porky and Bess came out before I could do that. So that was, that was scary. But no, the composer he should never have touched, never in a billion years, he should have run away from screaming, is Verdi. Oh, yeah. My God. He did the Verdi Requiem, and he did Aida two of the worst Verdi performances ever in the history of humanity, but for slightly different reasons. The Requiem suffers from uh, a lot of the problem with Harnoncourt's versions of romantic um, sacred music. And his problem was the same as Carrion's problem with it, actually. It's what I call the sanctimonious religiosity mode of performance. The idea of that because it's religious music, sacred music, it can't have climaxes, it can't be disruptive, it has to be earnest, it has to be, everything has to be constrained and constricted somehow, it has to have all of the austerity of a wooden benched Protestant church in the days before heating and electricity, you know, where you would sit on your butt for six hours on Easter Sunday, you know, in total misery. I mean, that's what his version of sacred music was. I don't understand why that's true either. I mean, it's totally contrary to what the music wants to do. It is a Verdi Requiem of total, utter dullness in every possible way. And the idea that this, this sort of muted, muffled, you know, you know underplayed, under, dynamically restricted approach is going to come across as religious and transcendental. I mean, you know. Where did that ever come from? I mean, whose idea of religion is that? Well, it must be somebody's because we hear it not infrequently. Um, but Harnoncourt often did that in romantic sacred music. His Brahms German Requiem was similarly afflicted. Sometimes it could work. There are some times where the reverent approach pays off. But, and we may talk about one of them over in the 10 best list. So, you know, go have a look at that. But not here, not in the Verdi Requiem, not in one of these hot-blooded, you know, passionate pieces of Italianate operatic lyricism. No. And the same problem, well, it's a different problem, let's put it this way. He's not playing Aida like it's religious music. So we, the, the sacred music approach 
isn't really what he's doing there. There he's just making a total, complete, untheatrical mess of it. And he really was very good with theatrics. He was into rhetoric, remember. He was into the drama. He was into, you know. But this Aida, oh, well, first of all, the casting was horrible. And the, the playing, is, it's so leaden. It's just an incredibly dull performance. It's one of those sort of perverse, um, you know, regie theater from the conductor performances where he's out to prove that Aida really is a German work, that it should be played with German seriousness. And that it is, I mean, it's, remember, Aida is exquisite. It's exquisitely orchestrated. It's colorful and beautiful. But that, that the symphonic approach meaning the complete abnegation <laughs> of anything eruptive or, or dazzling or surprising or has to be, it all has to be downplayed in favor of a legato singing line and motivic interaction between the parts. And I mean, it's just grotesquely misconceived, absolutely horrendous. And I mean, those for me, that Pastoral Symphony, the Brahms Symphonies, the Bruckner Eighth, and the Two Verities, the Requiem and Aida, are probably the worst things he did. I, and you'll notice none of them are Baroque things. None of them are early music because, and I, I have a real problem with some of his Baroque stuff too. But that is 99.9% .9 accompanying a choir or soloists who he trained. And, you know, maybe the music just is, is more amenable to that kind of thing because its scheme of contrasts is more rigid. You know, you, you, you're you either loud or you're soft or you're, you know, you've got trumpets and drums or you don't or, you know, you know the, the music tends to do its own thing far more than the music that requires the active participation of a conductor. And like so many early music specialists, when the conductor's active participation is called for, they tend to go crazy. It's like, oh, yes. Yes, now I get to actively participate. I get to take this fabulous jumbo orchestra and manipulate everything that I possibly can and make loud things soft and soft things loud. And, and, and Oh, I can hardly wait to get my hands on it. He was sort of like that in later music, or he could be. But by the same token, he could be a genius. He could be an absolute genius. And so in order to enjoy the parts where he is a genius, um, I urge you, if you have not, to please subscribe to ClassicsToday.com and to head on over, if you have subscribed, and go watch Harnoncourt's 10 Best Recordings video. Thank you so much for joining me. Keep on listening, friends, and take care.